Hey, good evening. Hello, everybody online. It's really nice to have everybody here. Uh, well done, those of you who braved the elements to be here. We were driving in the car yesterday or the day before, and my youngest boy said, Mum, look, it's in single digits for the first time since we arrived. So it must be really cold now. Um, it's a huge pleasure to have Vasif Sahoglu speaking to us tonight. He's a very good friend of the school and um, he um, it brings a smile to everybody's face every time you say he's uh, going to be here. So it's a, a great pleasure to meet you for the first time too. Uh, Vasif is a professor in archeology, span uh, kind of specializing in proto-history and Near Eastern archeology. span And he's, um, I mean, look, he's got a whole list of things that he's doing. So I don't even know how he has time to be here. He's currently director of Ankara, University Mustafa Koch Center Research Center for Maritime Archaeology. He's a, a professor in archaeology, as I said, as well. He ge works generally in Anatolia, uh, but his uh, excavations are focused at the site of Chesme and Liman uh, Tepe, too. He works generally on Bronze Age economies maritime archaeology, human responses to natural disasters. So you can come and study my responses to my children, which is uh, probably very fertile area. Um, and he sent me his kind of latest publications and I expected them to be, you know, from the last five years, but his latest publications are just from this year and there are like seven of them. So um, it's far too impressive to carry on talking about how great he is because it just makes me feel a bit ill. Um, however, uh, it is a real pleasure to have him. And we're going to hear from him about new evidence for Thera eruption, tsunamis at uh, Chesme in Western Anatolia. Vasif, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rebecca. <clears throat> and I also would like to thank you for the kind invitation. Uh, it's always, great. it feels great to be here in the BSA, like my home uh, here in Greece. And uh, also to Vangelio, uh, I would like to thank, uh, we are collaborating, always working and uh, thank you again for this kind uh, invitation. Uh, it's an honor to be here. So tonight I will be um, talking about some results of our um, recent <clears throat> interdisciplinary work at Çeşme Bağlar Arası, which is we, which we just published uh, at the beginning of this year in the journal PNAS. And the structure of my uh, talk. Sorry. Okay. Problem. <clears throat> Start from beginning. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Here we are. <laughs> uh, the structure of my talk will roughly follow. Uh, I will give you a general introduction about Cheshme Balarasa, <clears throat> our excavations there. <clears throat> I'm sorry. And tell you about the stratigraphic development at the site. Um, show you our uh, excavations, uh, our research questions, what we did so far and uh, what we are working on. A uh, little bit of our excavation methodologies and how it helped us to discover the uh, tsunami and volcanic ash at the site. And also show you this evidence here in the uh, more colorful way, let's say, uh, what we have in Cheshme Balaras and talk about the future perspectives a little. Uh, the fertile region of Izmir is located in the heart of central western Anatolian coastline. <clears throat> and this region is connected to central Anatolia through valleys of big rivers such as Meander and Kaikos uh, and uh, on one side and acts as a uh, one of the most important gateways of Western Anatolia, opening to the Aegean Sea through the many harbor settlements located on the coast. The economic importance of the region is also underlined through metal ores of copper, silver, lead, and gold, uh, particularly in the region of Baklatepe, ancient colophon. Therefore, with its fertile landscape, 
mineral sources. This unique location was an ideal landscape for habitation since prehistoric times. Izmir Region Excavations and Research Project is an ongoing project aiming to investigate and reconstruct the environmental changes and socioeconomic and political structure of Izmir Region uh, and coastal Western Anatolia during the prehistoric periods. Hirad was founded in 1992 under the direction of late Professor Hayat Erkanal and has been continuing under my direction as a project of Ankara University, Ankusam. The project includes excavations of uh, sites Panastepe, Limantepe, London underwater <coughs> excavations, uh, Kojabashtepe, um, Kömürburnu, and in Karaburun and Çeşme Bağlar Arası, all located around the Gulf of Izmir. Çeşme Bağlar Arası, <clears throat> which is going to form the main body of our talk today, is located in a narrow valley situated between two hills. And the harbor settlement must have shifted its location within the valley, depending on the changes of the coastline. Excavations revealed uh, the presence of a horizontally moving settlement at Balarasa, unlike the typical vertically stratified settlement types of Anatolia. The reasons behind this movement must be sought in the changing coastline of the area. Teshme Balarasa is inhabited at least from the third millennium BC onwards until the end of the late Bronze Age. Various gaps in the habitation history uh, are most probably due to the horizontally shifting of the settlement. <clears throat> One extremely interesting layer is, of course, the layer of the volcanic ash found in 2012, which marks a distinctive phase in the habitation history of the site. Geoarchaeological work conducted at the site by Ertuğener and Serdar Vardar revealed a preliminary reconstruction of the site's formation through time. <clears throat> According to this research, Çeşme Bağlararası was situated adjacent to a river and the earliest settlement was constructed adjacent and on top of a coastal marshy area. The fact that archaeological deposits at the site extends at least two meters below sea level clearly indicates the role of tectonics in the area. The active tectonic character of the region probably also has a role in the constantly shifting location of the settlement through time and offers an explanation for various gaps in the habitation history of Çeşme Bağlararası. A severe earthquake horizon of the Middle Bronze Age date is also found during the excavations. Balarasa today lies in the heart of Çeşme, one of the most touristic destinations in Turkey. And the site has one of the best harboring locations of the Aegean, which is serving as a marina today, as you can see here in this slide. Excavations revealed two settlement areas dating to the third millennium BC and the one to the second millennium BC. Our talk today will focus on the second millennium BC settlement. The earlier parts of the uh, second millennium BC is so far unknown uh, from Çeşme Bağlar Arası. The site began to flourish by the second quarter of the millennium and a fully organized harbor settlement belongs to this period. Centrally administered polities emerged both in Anatolia and in the Aegean during this period, characterized by increased social complexity and intensification of inter-regional connectivity. These are, of course, the Hittites in central Anatolia and the minor ones in the west, in the sea. Çeşme Bağlar Arası, phase two, reflects the earliest fully organized plan of the second millennium BC settlement, <clears throat> based on the data available at hand. At least three successive phases have been recorded, 2C to 2A, uh, 2B being the best documented. A severe earthquake horizon is separating uh, phase 2B from 2A, further highlighting the tectonic character of the area. <clears throat> the more eastern part of the fortifications surrounding the site was unearthed during the excavations. The construction technique indicates that the walls were constructed in blocks abutting to each other. A small bastion was also built exactly at the adjoining point of the two separate fortification blocks for further strengthening the system. Çeşme Bağlar Arası to be settlement <clears throat> consists of insular houses 
separated from each other by streets that are attached to the fortification wall. The settlement has a main a street, which is following the same layout as the fortification wall. And narrower streets, sorry. The narrower uh, streets are attached to this main street. The majority of houses are rectangular or trapezoid in shape and constitute their own walls attached to the adjacent one. They all have domed ovens in the left inner corner of the house. And the excavated part of the settlement also constitutes a domestic corner <clears throat> um, where almost all of the buildings seem to have been used as houses, except for two distinctive structures which are located at important locations on the main artery at the junction points of the streets. One of these features is has an entrance from the main artery. The main room is followed by three subterranean rooms which are accessed from above. The main room included uh, various installations associated with ground stones and were probably used as a wine workshop where the grapes were crushed and juice was collected. The building was severely destroyed during the earthquake that brought an end to Cheshmet to be face. The two big face pots you see here uh, were found in the debris of the house, collapsed into the street during this big earthquake. The southern room <clears throat> yielded carbonized seeds of various uh, species, indicating that it might have been used as a storage area. The one in the middle was plastered all over, all, on all sides with the floor as well. And it gave us an impression that this might be like a container for storing liquids, in this case, wine. <clears throat> and the final room included many ceramic pots, mainly for liquids and drinking, drinking and uh, transporting liquids. The wine workshop at Cheshme Balarase, located at a strategic location within the settlement, clearly demonstrates production beyond the level of con uh, consumption of a single household. And uh, thus gives us an important hint regarding the socioeconomic organization of the inhabitants of the site during this period. A pottery kiln uh, <clears throat> unearthed yet on another strategic location and again on the main artery, further gives us a glimpse of this organization activities at the site during the second quarter of the second millennium BC. Kitchen of a house adjacent to the wine house it completely collapsed during the earthquake, thus offering us a unique study case for analyzing uh, the complete inventory of a kitchen during this period. The earliest imported pottery of Cheshme also <clears throat> appeared during this phase. They are all in fine wares. A pedestal jar uh, appears both in local fabrics and in imported fabrics as well. Cheshme to be face, ends with a severe earthquake I've uh, been mentioning, and which destroys almost all the buildings and the fortification wall. The following phase 2A sees the reorganization of the site. Some streets of the previous period were blocked by the newly built walls or have been narrowed. Some walls also went out of use. The most distinctive change is the reduction of the size of the settlement by building a new fortification wall on top of the uh, houses of earlier period. And uh, a probable gateway is also spotted on the eastern side of the uh, excavation area. But unfortunately, we were unable to further investigate this because there's a tree right on top of that location. Uh, tan the only tangerine tree in the, in the field. <laughs> This horizon <laughs> is marked with construction of numerous plastered stone line or clay basins, along with hearts and ovens all around the settlement, probably indicating a phase of survival following the earthquake. <clears throat> the pottery tradition continued from the previous phase with no change. Even the imported pottery seemed to have followed similar patterns, implying similar maritime connections. Cheshme Balarasit phase 2A ends with a so far unknown event, 
which may be related to another earthquake, but currently there's not enough evidence on this matter. The site seemed to have been deserted following the end of this phase. The deserted settlement then turned into an area with half buried house remains and potential sources of building materials. No architectural future of this following level one has been found at the excavated trenches. The presence of this level is attested only in pits and destruction fields throughout the excavated area. <clears throat> Based on the interdisciplinary studies of our team members, <clears throat> we can now say that Cheshma Balara's level one reflects a complete transformation of the site into a whole new concept where it became a widely connected site and its material culture shows distinctively Aegean futures. Our Ankara University British School at Athens Fitch Lab collaboration on the study of pottery from Cheshme Bağlar Arası revealed that the most striking evidence for this um, transformation lies in the appearance of new category of ceramic vessels, richly decorated and linked to drinking sets that echo Cretan practices and reflect direct or indirect associations with the Minoan world. Level one deposits yielded numerous pottery fragments, highlighting a dramatic change in pottery manufacturing technologies from the previous phase. New shapes dominate the pottery repertoire, among which incense burners, well known from my Minoan cultural sphere, holds an important place. Dark on light and light on dark varieties of painted pottery are found in these deposits, along with monochrome slips and plain wares. Two distinct categories identified among the painted pottery. These are the Minoan and the so-called <clears throat> Minoanizing examples. The Minoan pottery shows strong stylistic and technological similarities with Knossian pottery so their provenance is tentatively uh, associated with central Crete. A steatite stone vase from this level can be interpreted as an exotic object, prestige object, opening a new dimension to our understanding of the site's character during this phase. The textile tools at the site, currently under study by Melissa Fetters from Salzburg University, and uh, based on her preliminary uh, observations, the Middle Bronze Age toolkit for textile production comprised mainly spindle whorls and bone tools, but also the very first horizontally pierced spools. There is a striking uh, change by level one, however, where the use of rub uh, weighted loom attested by discoid loom weights is fully introduced as a new technology that shows again strong connections with the Minoan world. Archaeobotanical research has been taking place at Cheshme Bağlar Arası since uh, 2000, uh, 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 led by Tom uh, Maltas. And uh, this revealed a high diversity of plants exploited at the site, just as the previously explained uh, elements. So we can also talk about the introduction of new species in Cheshme Bağlar Arası level one. Our research among other various important questions also focuses on more controversial topic of explaining the nature of Minoan, Minoanizing elements in this area around the second quarter of the second millennium BC. <clears throat> of course, this is a complex phenomenon that requires a multi-proxy archeological study and is currently being investigated at Cheshme Bağlaras in terms of bioarchaeological material, as well as pottery studies and studies of textile tools as well, along with the other excavations. Um, <clears throat> changing technologies and introduction of new shapes and clay sources in pottery and introduction of new technologies in textile making, differences in animal husbandry and crop cultivation will be giving us important clues regarding the character of the big changes that took place at Cheshme Bağlar Arası around the second quarter of the second millennium BC. As we were excavating at Cheshme Bağlar Arası, we were always chasing answers for the basic question of what happened to the level one settlement and why do we only find it in pits and fields? What we found in the first excavation seasons in 2003 and four uh, is a settlement like this here in the photograph, the perfectly preserved uh, architectural remains and, uh, and contexts. <clears throat> but 
what we found uh, in our excavations from 2009 onwards at the plot right next to uh, the other one was this, a total destruction, lots of rubble, pits and fields, which included pottery of our level one, which is contemporary with um, late minor one, 1A. In 2002, while we were excavating this plot, <clears throat> we came across with an interesting deposit at the edge of the trench. It was an ash layer extending in an approximately 15 meter square area. And this was an area outside the fortifications of Chishme level two, meaning it was an area outside the settlement. And you can see here better <clears throat> this uh, deposit, uh, the white line over there and right there going and touching to the fortification wall. And when we found it, of course, uh, this ash looked just like normal uh, burned ash, but uh, luckily I was uh, somehow uh, familiar with the volcanic. I mean, I, I was always looking for volcanic ash at the site, but uh, <laughs> back then when I was at East Up uh, EC, uh, I had the chance to go to Mohlos and see the original uh, volcanic ash uh, there. So I looked at this and it was these uh, little glass uh, particles. So. We thought, okay, this is volcanic ash. And then uh, of course we send a sample to VM Atom Institute and Johannes Sterba and Max Bihler, who were also doing different analyses in Western Anatolia as well at the time. They did uh, analysis. It took uh, many years until this issue was resolved. Uh, but in the end, for example, I gave another talk uh, here at the BSA 10, 12 years ago. Uh, and at that time, I was talking about, oh, there are volcan volcanic ashes here coming from two separate sources. And uh, well, <laughs> we, uh, it's uh, Santorini ash, but mixed with uh, something else, because this was the information I was given at the time. <clears throat> but now it's all resolved. Uh, it's uh, Santorini ash, uh, we know it, and it's originating from the eruption of Terra. Uh, underneath this ash layer, uh, we came across with a layer of chaotic deposits, including big stones, the ones you see over there, and rubble that yielded archaeological material, again, contemporary with late Minoan 1A. So I'll put some more photos for you to see how this deposit is uh, coming underneath the ash. Uh, it's full of this, uh, these stones like piled up there. And, they were uh, very difficult to excavate as well because they were squeezed uh, so hardly. And this is how they look while uh, we excavated it. In the meantime, I always uh, found the Northern section of the um, uh, trench very interesting because um, it was giving me the impression of a fill rather than a stratified uh, settlement deposit. And uh, as you can see also in these other photographs, uh, it was looking like that. So seeing all this, I thought, could this be uh, really a tsunami deposit? Because once uh, we identified the volcanic ash, <clears throat> this was automatically the question that came to my mind. You can see here uh, on the section. So seeing all this, uh, I contacted my uh, good friend, Beverly Goodman, with whom we also collaborated in the past before. And at that time, Beverly was beginning to uh, in research uh, tsunami uh, uh, deposits uh, in the Mediterranean. So uh, she came and we did sampling and looked at the data. This was back in 2015. Uh, in the end, of course, Cheshme Balara's excavations continued. And in 2019, we completed the excavations uh, there. And in the meantime, uh, Bev also uh, finished her analysis and uh, uh, by the end we see the full picture at Chishma Balaras in front of our eyes and we realized that the site was actually uh, devastated by a series of tsunamis uh, generated by the eruption of Terra. <clears throat> I want to show you how we uh, actually excavated and uh, saw this uh, all this tsunami deposit. This is the area we, we excavated and it was very difficult to excavate because as you can see, it's all fields and uh, destruction deposits. 
but of course we excavated according to our uh, documentation system uh, collecting material from different different uh, deposits and the way i was excavating was uh, i wanted to excavate all the level one material on the site so once we scrape excavated all the level one material this is what was left uh, out of it so all you see here is actually belongs to our level two and all the other deposits you saw on top are uh, the tsunami deposit in fact there is also a, a fallen wall over there uh, which probably fall uh, during the when the tsunami came and it uh, fall into the house. So <clears throat> the <clears throat> sedimentological um, uh, analysis or something from the section where the ash was unearthed re revealed three main uh, sequences, which we called H1, H2, uh, uh, and H3, and the lowermost. H1 uh, all belongs to, um, which is further subdivided into four phases, A to D, uh, is the one which I'll be talking about. And so this is the layer which is uh, contemporary with our HML level one. The base of the sequence, the lowest one, where I forgot to put the A, uh, contains <laughs> framework supported uh, rubble, um, pottery, uh, which is uh, again contemporary with late Minoan uh, 1A, uh, shell and bone. <clears throat> 1B, which is above, is similar, but has a matrix uh, supported sediments without bedding, a fine non-continuous ash layer. There's a very thin uh, line of ash there as well. And um, imbricated inclusions and smaller rubble pieces. And these ca uh, chaotic characteristics are topped by a thicker ash layer whose elemental values match the tephra found from the late Bronze Age eruption of Terra. That's the line uh, I showed you earlier, the white line over there. The lower contact of the thick ash layer is sharp and the upper contact has truncated uh, flame-like uh, structures. See better there. And uh, approximately eight centimeter thick layer, H1C, about the ash contains similar sediments and inclusions as H1B. However, instead of another ash layer, it ends with a distinctive charcoal rich lens uh, with charred remains. Maybe you can see some darker uh, burnt ash and, uh, pieces. The top layer of the sequence, H1D, repeats the similar settlements, including uh, uh, inclusions and pottery, which is again contemporary with late one, minor one, one A, but with the addition of larger rubble. So basically, uh, the entire H1 sequence has an uh, overall average foraminifera abundance of five to nine individual per cc and 2.9 cc species with a high proportion of staining. The archaeological and sedimentological results from H1 horizon at Cheshme Bağlararası include ample indicators known from modern and paleo tsunami deposits, including alaptonous marine inclusions, higher foraminifera abundance with staining, elemental trends skewed towards marine like values, imbrication, collapsed structures, and a non deliberate burial. A patch of Cerastoderma glaucum, which are brackish water clams that live in highly concentrated beds, is also found within the tsunami, which you can see down there, next to the fortification. Patella marine limpet mollusks were also identified among the rubble. And these species attach themselves to hard surface, such as rocky coasts or marine structures, and simply could have arrived during the tsunami. Uh, there are also signs of collapse and intrusion into the buildings at the site that doesn't fit earthquake uh, evidence because the damage is unidirectional and nearby walls are unaffected. So here is another uh, area which we excavated. And so, uh, and in this uh, house, uh, you will see a house there appearing, which belongs to our level two. And all the field inside the dark uh, colored uh, soil is actually the tsunami field. 
There is also um, a rubble layer which intrudes from a collapsed version of the wall and is blanketed by dark soil that continues even further into the room. You can see it in that corner, it's going to appear better. So that part of the fortification uh, collapsed into the house uh, during the uh, tsunami. And <clears throat> also um, such uh, deposits would have required a very uh, strong force to dismantle and redistribute the stones. Tsunami deposits blocked by the fortification wall can also be seen outside the fortification where, where I put the red star. You can see that, uh, <clears throat> that rubble came from outside and hit the fortification wall and uh, accumulated there. So we are, we think uh, we are looking at the tip of the iceberg here because <clears throat> there are also <clears throat> many more contexts that we need to study and analyze in the following uh, months and years to come. And just to give you a sneak peek of what is there to come, I want to show these slides. The photo above is the section uh, of this uh, red line here. So we are looking from outside to that point. And um, you can see, I don't know if you can see it clearly, but if you look at the section, you can see all those uh, intrusions, like waves of intrusions uh, there, which uh, uh, shows us actually a channeling, so tsunami, which went into the settlement coming from outside. And uh, <clears throat> I would also like to take your attention to where I put the red star on the right upper uh, corner. There is there a massive piece of a mud brick wall which collapsed into the tsunami and is uh, hanging there. It happened to be where we had the section. So we managed to document it, it nicely. And that's also part of the collapse that's caused by the tsunami. Here you can see the, I highlighted it again, the intrusion parts. Uh, clearer and um, they went into the settlement. These photos here are taken after the uh, Sumatra uh, tsunami. They show the devastating dimensions of the disaster, but are also striking. Uh, what's also striking here is the similarities or the type of channeling that the tsunami uh, is making into the settlement. You can see that the tsunami went into the settlement and some futures are uh, not fully destroyed, but on the other hand, some others which are further inside, totally destroyed and there are these channelings. Uh, oh, <laughs> see that's going inside. Uh, further away from this channeling uh, in the excavated part where the red star is, is another uh, similar one, which we excavated. And this area yielded one of the most interesting discoveries of this horizon, namely a skeleton of an articulated young human male. And the body was uh, found within the rubble in a prone, slightly curved position following the curvature of the limits of the tsunami intrusion. The skeleton doesn't show any signs of, signs of deliberate, uh, culturally appropriate burial. So that when you look at the positioning of the skeleton, that there are no grave goods, no contextual treatment. And the location of the skeleton also exhibits classic signatures of the position <coughs> within the brief. <coughs> um, you can see, it, I guess, and it has these uh, big stones all accumulated on top of the skeleton. I'll show you. Uh, it was found in that where the red star is in that deposit, which is again the continuation of the previous channelings that I showed you. So the uh, tsunami must have come from outside uh, of the settlement, and this poor person, Cheshma man, we call him, uh, must have uh, traveled all the way to there. And that's the that's the end of the uh, tsunami destruction. By the way, this this remains here. You see. They belong to our uh, level uh, 2A. So the tsunami came all the way to that point and he is found in the innermost uh, part of the tsunami uh, uh, destruction in the site. So that's interesting. Um, after a natural disaster, uh, uh, also, sorry, uh, the uh, skeleton is also, we are currently <coughs> studying it. Uh, Yilmaz Erda from Hacettepe University is uh, doing the anthropological study. Uh, and 
who will be publishing it soon, I hope. After a natural disaster such as a tsunami, survivors are tasked with the responsibility of rescuing victims, recovering the dead, caring for the injured, and post-event cleanup. The Çeşme Bağlar Arası, this effect is visible in the presence of misshapen pits, interpreted here uh, as the preserved remains from their effort to retrieve victims from the tsunami debris. The human skeleton was located about a meter <laughs> below such a pit, suggesting that it was too deep to be found and retrieved, and therefore probably unknowingly left behind. In both the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami and 2011 Tohoku earthquake tsunami, missing persons accounted for over 10% of the death, even a decade after the event. Victims that are swept up in the debris flow during the tsunami can get deeply buried within it or drown at sea, thereby making 100% victim uh, recovery unrealistic. The Çeşme Bağlar Arası young man uh, is an ancient example of this phenomenon. You can see our uh, how we were excavating the pits of different fields. And here is the tsunami uh, rescue excavations at the tsunami for looking for the dead people. So you can see the accumulations of different uh, types of material. And it, it looks exactly the same uh, to us. The dating of the eruption of Terra is, of course, one of the hottest debates in Mediterranean archaeology. According to the archaeological correlations, the event occurred during the late Minoan 1A period, which is also shown at Çeşme Bağlaras. This period is generally compared to the 18th Egyptian dynasty in, in the 16th century BC. The range of dates is termed, this range of dates uh, is termed the low chronology. However, measurements from radiocarbon dating of holy wood from the ash layers at Santorini have produced older ages, preliminary in the mid uh, late 17th century BC, <clears throat> a range of dates referred to as high chronology. This mismatch upsets the understanding of which people, what powers and related events coexisted at the time. In our recent study, we published nine new radiocarbon dates all coming from the deposits of Çeşme Bağlar Arası Level 1, which is contemporary with late Minoan 1A. As you can see, all radiocarbon ages have two sigma time ranges that coincide with both the high and the low chronologies for the late Bronze Age Terra eruption and tsunami events. However, the samples also group in two clusters, one which encompasses more of the high range and the other the low range. <clears throat> So we haven't solved the problem, <laughs> but <laughs> it is important that uh, to note that uh, this clustering has no association with stratigraphic uh, position. The significance of this is there is no gradient by depth with age, and therefore the horizons were deposited in rapid sequence. We suggest that because all the samples are from a well-sealed but mixed tsunami context, the youngest ages are more relevant for determining the age of the event itself. According to this principle, the entire event horizon cannot be older than the youngest measurement within it. So the two clusters may reflect the mixing from the underlying <laughs> archeological site, which is an older out of use portion of the site while the younger cluster of ages is the materials introduced during or just before the event itself. Accordingly, the two sigma radiocarbon age results of the sample closest to the human skeleton, the one at the bottom, um, after calibration is uh, 1612 to 1575 and 1565 to 1501, and would be the most representative of the event's age we think. While these ages do not negate either chronology, it does limit the age to no, long, no, uh, no earlier than 1612 BC and includes ample support for the low chronology. We are very well aware <clears throat> that the calibration uh, within this time is notoriously problematic and has long been the subject of extensive research. While the dates presented here do not definitely resolve the issue, 
They do provide fresh radiocarbon data uh, from a well-sealed archaeologically associated Tehran eruption-related event horizon in the Aegean and will likely open new discussions. We propose that the late Bronze Age eruption of Terra volcano produced a series of tsunami landfalls that also arrived at the Western Anatolian Aegean site of Çeşme Bağlarası in the semi-closed Bay of Çeşme within a short period of time. We think Çeşme level one settlement was located a few hundred meters north of the excavated areas and is currently lying under the modern town of Çeşme where we have the red star, uh, yellow one, sorry. The red one is the one we excavated. The arrival of the tsunamis must have literally wiped out the entire settlement and brought it the, its debris into and over the ruins of the nearby settlement, which was already out of use at the time of the event. Thus, all the level one material found at the excavations most probably arrived as part of the tsunami deposits. There are four discernible horizons identified, though more could be present. The identification of multiple tsunami events at Çeşme Bağlararası suppose, supports the proposed view that there were distinctive eruption phases with varying hiatuses between them. <clears throat> While <laughs> many tsunami scenarios concentrate attention towards the southern or southeastern directions or near field along the outskirts of the island itself, some simulations include as far north as Çeşme. Discovery of tsunami deposits generated at Balararası is the first evidence that supports this model. <clears throat> Çeşme Balararası is only one of the many coastal settlements impacted by the eruption and related earthquakes, tsunamis, ashfall, and fires, and will probably uh, provide a type site reference for identifying others. <clears throat> Despite the presumed regional impact, Tsunami evidence has only been reported at a handful of late Bronze Age sites, namely Malia, Gues, Palais Castro, Leton, Miletus, and Fethiye. <clears throat> we argue that this start of report is an artifact or methodological approach where the ability to identify paleo tsunami sediments has advanced in the recent years. And specifically with regard to the case of the late Bronze Age Terran eruption, the presence of Tephra has been the baseline observation wherein consideration of a possible paleo tsunami uh, deposit followed. Although prevailing winds direct the ash cloud, the tsunami waves are propagated in a linear concentric pattern to large distances, provided there is no obstacle in the, in this case, the wave energy will bend interfering and reflecting of one another resulting in either increased or decreased wave heights and coastal inundation. Tsunamis, unlike tephra fallout, are independent of wind patterns. Therefore, <clears throat> even in the absence of ash fallout in air areas such as the Western Aegean, the Cycladic Islands, Northern Aegean coast, tsunami deposits may be present. Following the event, according to the archeological remains, <clears throat> the thriving community at Çeşme Bağlararası ceased to exist for more than a century. In addition to loss of life and property damage, any coastal futures or harbor areas would have been debris thrown and made unusable or highly compromised for a period. The ash deposits would have altered the chemistry of the soils, impacted aquifers and damaged crops. Seaborne trade at the time of the event was central to the vitality of power of societies, in particularly the sea dominating Minoans. The social fallout from the destruction of the system's core infrastructure cannot be understated. While many people survived the event, the dynamics of everyday life, political relationships and economic structures would have shifted. Disasters and human reaction to them alter societies. In the case of the late Bronze Age eruption of Terra, it can be considered a compound disaster wherein multiple short-term uh, and long-term challenges necessitated societal responses that would have had a gen multi-generational impact. While many people survived the event, their worlds must have changed. Çeşme uh, Bağlar as seen here, silently lying under the modern town of Çeşme, 
began to tell us its story with all its glory and tragedy. Cheshma Man, a probable inhabitant of the site, is one of the first representatives of the many people who died or went missing on that tragic day, but probably will help many others to be found by archeologists in the future. Our excavations and study of, uh, at Cheshma Bağlararası <clears throat> have been continuing in collaborative effort of international participation and interdisciplinary work. I would like to thank to everyone involved in the project, uh, from uh, scholars to our students, uh, for their valuable efforts and contributions. Our gratitude also goes to the supporting institutes, which I'm mentioning here, uh, of Çeşme Bağlaras and IRAP project, especially Turkish Ministry of Culture, Ankara University Institute for Asian uh, uh, Prehistory. And I also would like to remember uh, our uh, late uh, professor, mentor, Professor Erkanal, who passed away in 2019, and Reza Tunja, my uh, very good friend, whom we lost this September. I dedicate it to them, and I thank you all for your patience and interest. Thank you. very much, uh, Masif. I'm sure there are lots of questions. And there were two highlights for me in your paper. The first was those beautiful open area excavations. They were yeah. fabulous, gorgeous pits and things like that. But the other one was, I've never heard anyone be so happy and so uh, chilled about their uh, dating for the Thera eruption, which is normally quite punchy in yeah. so many ways. Um, yeah. So um, can we open up the floor to questions, please? Any questions from here? And Rachel, are you keeping an eye? People online, if they want to put their questions in the Q&A um, or the chat, whatever works easiest. So any questions from the room? You've convinced everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Tom. So, let's see, it's a great talk. Uh, I noticed on your one slide you had the pattern of distribution of pumps. Yes. Recently, it's increasing. Uh, we found tiny little particles of pumps in the flotation. And I wanted to ask you if in any of your flotation had you found tiny, almost grain, sand grain size formation of pumps in your actual. Uh, yeah, okay, the ash layer that I showed here is, uh, it was a uh, one uniform uh, deposit, so it's like that. We have tons of work to be done and tons of material to look into. We are floating everything, you know, collecting all the data, but it will take uh, really a long time for us to really go back and look into them with all these uh, details. So I'm sure uh, there must be, uh, but uh, but we, we collected all of this. So of course, uh, in Krisi, uh, which uh, in LM1A, like when did you same find this? Same horizon. Same horizon. We uncovered large, significant deposits of ash, some mm -hmm. of which includes temporal particles. But in a few amount, we found there are discrete layers of tiny bits of pumps. And our question is, could it possibly be airborne Mm. Terror, which hasn't been yeah it i think it, as far as i know i'm not an expert on this but uh, of course it has to do with the distance uh, we i wouldn't expect that to come all the way to cheshme even the deposit uh, which i uh, we gave to be some uh, analyzed um, and as i said we were told that they were kind of mixed uh, because they said uh, there are bigger particles in it, which cannot come all the way to Cheshme airborne. Mm. But then later we figured out because it's from the local geology of the area, those bigger particles. So um, I don't expect pumice to, for our area, yeah. but Chrissy is uh, much closer. So. Awesome. Um, so we have a representative from the source of the problem. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I was not there. <laughs> <laughs> Never let me say that I was there. Pumice is a material that floats. Yes. Never sinks. So it can travel far away 
as long as it says it is fallen, you will see. So uh, I don't think that the pumice went very high in the atmosphere during the eruption. Uh, and uh, of course, the spread of tephra of ash was much more uh, much greater yes. in the, the distribution. Uh, so I think that uh, there is mainly has uh, uh, is airborne dust, yes. mm -hmm. which uh, gradually uh, accumulated. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> yes, no, I agree fully. And uh, on the other hand, the tsunami, uh, I don't think it was, it must have been so violent. It was just rise of the level of the sea, because as uh, <coughs> north, the sea is narrowing, therefore all the water which is moved is just rising. It's rising, yes, true, because we uh, of course, Evi is there. <laughs> she knows the best uh, about this. But like people always ask me, oh, how did the big wave pass from the corner, the little hill ne next to Cheshman? And I'm like, it, it's not the wave height, but it's the, also the volume. The main thing is the volume of the yeah, city, yeah, which is I crazy, that, uh, destroying it. The destruction is uh, the the direction in which the walls are fallen is towards the sea, not inwards. Not to the sea, but also uh, in a strange direction, like uh, sea is here, yeah. the walls this, went down. This shows that probably <clears throat> the buildings were filled in with water. Yeah. And when the level of the water went down, it was the walls were <coughs> Yes, there are different uh, examples. We found the fallen walls as well. Um, Rachel, do you have any online questions? Yes. Uh, so <laughs> the first one is, your map shows that pumice sites have been detected on Cyprus. Have these been followed up by excavation? Um, as far as I know, not by excavation. Uh, do, is there another one? Uh, and the second one is, have you sampled for Fora Minifera, which provides some information on tsunamis, especially if there are species of deeper water? Well, there are Fora Minifera in our deposits, tsunami deposits. We haven't, uh, we didn't carry uh, on specific analysis on them. <laughs> but according to information given to me by Beverly, uh, these are, they have stains on them, and this shows. Uh, that they arrived to the site during a sudden event. I also learned uh, <laughs> during the work of this publication. Uh, Sandy, question. It, it, it could be just me, but I, I didn't fully understand the sequence. Did you have the ash falling before the tsunami or after the tsunami? Yes, Sandy, this was, this was our starting uh, theory. What happens? Okay, tsunami goes, and then the ash comes, and it finishes, we were thinking, of course. But as we started working on it, I was looking into archeological material and Beverly was looking in her analysis uh, independently. And suddenly I was seeing all these, our level one deposits also on top of the ash, which was very puzzling at the first moment because the, they had to finish <laughs> with, the, with the ash. And, uh, but in the meantime, she also uh, apparently discovered that the, there is a slide which shows it actually, uh, that the, all the, um, I can show you if you like, all the um, analysis is showing uh, us that it's the uh, same kind of uh, feel is continuing there as well. So I don't know why I can't see it. Was it before? I want to show you on the... Oh, there, the part with the, uh, the green part uh, in the analysis. So you can see the ash is below and also a part of, on top of the ash is the same uh, signature with the soil below the ash up to a point. 
which is uh, what I, which, which was what I also saw with archaeological material. It was LM1A uh, contemporary level one material all the way to that point. So that's how we understood that there were series of tsunamis that arrived to the site. Maybe there was a couple of days silence and ash accumulated thicker, and then it came back again. There was a series of events uh, <laughs> that happened. <coughs> This that sequence helps you feed back into people studying the volcano. Yes. The different sequences within the within the eruption itself. Yes. Also, there are some works uh, while we were work studying the, this uh, article. <coughs> so we saw that uh, there are also uh, published various uh, you know events happening, and uh, of course they are timing. Maybe our work will tell us some more finer, higher resolution uh, information about the timing of, uh, uh, or uh, silence in between these. We'll have to work more uh, on the material to see. It says uh, in uh, at the theory, we find uh, mixed with the, uh, not so much with pumice, but with ash, huge blocks which were thrown and came by air from the volcano. At least that's the, the specialists say, because they have also estimated the speed and uh, the uh, uh, curve they, they made. Uh, but the uh, I think the uh, greatest tsunamis were created after the collapse of the caldera, of the, the, during the formation of the caldera, because <coughs> then the water uh, went in and all the movement was, was towards uh, the south, uh, I mean, from southwest, maybe, where the openings are, uh, to the crater. and. Uh, when it filled, then the tsunami started going backwards. Yes, there are also like different thicknesses. So <clears throat> fields that we have, depending on uh, yes. the activity happening in your <laughs> home. And the, according, <laughs> to the, according to the volcanologists, this eruption uh, lasted quite some time. It was not just one event. It started with minor uh, tremors, uh, uh, ejections, and finally uh, the collapse of the crater and caldera formation. So uh, we have a lot of steps. Even, yes. Just, just to add to that, another reason why you could have a long time of tsunamis is that it's not just the caldera collapse at the end, but it's also the periclastic flows yes. shooting out before the collapse, which are also theorized to cause tsunamis. So your first ones picking up could be that. In other words, what you're picking up can be fed back into the models that they're working on in theory. So it kind of helps with the periclastic flow mm -hmm. model as well. True, truly. Yeah, yeah so. I totally agree with you. Uh, yeah. Because uh, I'm a from the University of Athens, I'm a marine geologist, so I'm studying Sadorin for many years now. So we have been investigating the whole area around Sadorin doing some uh, multi channel seismic profiles. So we have all the geophysical data of the area. And uh, we do, uh, we agree that the pyroclastic flow is created, triggered. Uh, the tsunami of uh, this fair reaction. And the other thing is that uh, we have analyzed all the new multi channel seismic profiles, and we think uh, we just uh, submitted a paper to Nature Communication. It is accepted up to now, but we know that the volume of the linear reduction may be uh, smaller, much, much smaller. Even though we, uh, up to now, for the paper of Sigmund Tonetel in 2006, we knew that the volume was almost uh, 86 cubic kilometers. Just taking account uh, the onshore and offshore data. Now that we reprocessed all the multi channel profiles around Sodorini, uh, we think that the pyroclastic flows don't have so much volume. But of course, we will have more uh, answers to our questions when the IODP, there will be a, a huge expedition 
uh, in two days uh, from December 11th up uh, February uh, 12th. So we are going to drill around Santorini mm -hmm. up to the depth of uh, 850 meters and also within Caldera in two sites, one in the northern part of the Caldera and the one on the southern part up to the depth of 350 meters and we hope uh, Tim Druid, uh, the famous volcanologist, uh, will be the chief scientist of this cruise, but we do hope that the mineral deposits within the caldera is buried, uh, buried uh, up to the depth of uh, almost 200 meters. Mm -hmm. So having the new data from IODP expedition, we are going to answer also our questions as geologists uh, for all this the huge eruption <coughs> of the link. And that was also one of the reasons uh, that the IODP uh, give us the permission or give us the money to do this uh, huge uh, expedition. But, we know uh, having, having in, in our hands new seismic profiles, we do believe that the middle class that flows uh, uh, plays played a very huge role, very specific role in, the, in this eruption. And the caldera collapse follows. Okay. And uh, we have also found, as also Vasek uh, said, that there was a channel between the Asia and um, here, there was a channel. And this channel was built up with uh, all this volcanic material after the eruption, and it was blocked. So the caldera, the last phases uh, of the eruption, was dry, and then the water entered into the caldera uh, and was lasted for almost uh, two days, having in mind all the models uh, that the University of Cremont uh, has played. So yeah, also for us, it's a mystery for, from the geological point of view, and that's why I repeat. Uh, we give us some answers in a few days. Fortunately, <laughs> that we will have this comment. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully, yes. <laughs> hopefully, we'll hope so. Fingers crossed. But that maybe will be your fantastic. I'm taken aback that by your you're going to drill down 850 meters. Yeah, outside. Uh, that's close to the part of Anafi in Anafi Basin, and we'll be up to the depth of uh, 857. But we did the caldera. We did the caldera because we know what is the roof of the magmatic chamber, because we have also the data from seismic chromography. So they give us permission to drill up to 353 meters. Very close to Anafi. Okay, and we hope we hope that we will find uh, the mineral deposits uh, because we know that the first layers are uh, came from other eruptions from the Akamanian, Pariakamanian, and other deposits are buried uh, down to the Hadera. That's right. These are assumptions, but we will see in few months. Yeah, now it's in two days. Fantastic. Uh, Rachel, do you have another online question? Yeah. So the first question is how can you explain the preservation of the thin volcanic ash layer in between the two tsunami deposits? Bro, uh, <laughs> it's just uh, probably it was a bit thicker at that time, but you know, when I imagine when the new tsunami uh, wave comes, it also wipes out up to a point, but it means uh, there was some kind of a break there. Uh, and this is what we want to actually understand. This will give us good clues for understanding the time uh, sequence in between the different uh, events that's happening. So if there is a line, I would think that there was some uh, quiet time in between, but how, <laughs> how long this was, uh, we'll have to, work and see and also learn because this is a I think this is a new thing you know uh, so it's we will we will know more as we and other sites I'm sure other sites are also going to discover all these deposits maybe they already discovered I know that some discovered I see in the publications photographs but uh, they will be reworked let's say and we'll know more uh, might link quite well to the second question, uh, which is, is there any information in the wider area on sea level changes and coastal evolution? Well, um, I think sea level changes, because we work also in Limantepe, especially on this topic. <clears throat> you mean in general, the question means in general, right? I think so. Yeah, because I think it's a more local event, because there are all these micro 
other uh, factors which are affecting the sea level, like in Limantepe, there are tectonics, so a tectonic happens, the site uh, submerges, so sea level rises, uh, which is all affecting the changes in the coastlines. So um, it's a very complex phenomenon to, to really, it's, it's, I don't think it's so easy to answer only the sea level rise uh, question because of these fa these other factors this is what i saw in our own uh, research we can't just say that oh it's raising this much uh, <laughs> of course there are models about it but i'm saying we need to uh, consider uh, other factors as well for each region each micro region let's say. We have time for one last question. Also, also I'm not a <laughs> geologist. <laughs> uh, in a sense, not a uh, question. First of all, congratulations but on everything. But I was really impressed by your definition of the post uh, tsunami clear up. People yes. searching for bodies or, uh, you know, uh, people still alive and this sort of thing. And um, I think you demonstrated it really well. Um, it would be nice. Uh, elsewhere in earthquake deposits to find good solid evidence of such uh, actions. Because uh, I think you demonstrated it marvelously, and that, that was Thank one you. of the most exciting human things um, yeah. of, the, of the lecture for me. Thank you. Uh, yeah, you know, <coughs> maybe they are found also after the earthquakes, like we are finding them, but calling them pits and <laughs> things, and it's just, it's a uh, we need to think of this way, let's say, to interpret them. Like these pits, we, we excavated the <clears throat> tsunami deposits as pits and fields. We didn't know it was a tsunami. Mm -hmm. And we were always discussing, well, how did this happen? Why did, they, <laughs> why did this happen? I personally excavated the plot right next to it with all the streets, the houses, like mm -hmm. everything is there. And then, you know, five, you know, 10 meters next door, I excavated and this, this thing, all the structure. And so we have been <clears throat> asking all these questions. And then once we started to solve it, like it settled, <laughs> felt, felt good <laughs> that it has a meaning to me. Fantastic. Thank you. Well, um, thank you very much, Rasik. That was a fabulous lecture. <laughs> thank you. Um,